But first up, Karen Chi. Karen is a writer and a comedian, and she was named one of the 20 comedians to watch in New York City in 2018. And as luck would have it, here we are in 2018. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I fully thought that that meant I had all of 2018 to prepare for 2019. But I'm glad you're here watching me now. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on the time. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Karen Chi. This is the loudest I've ever been in a library before. <laughs> uh, this is true. When I was little, I used to go to the library all the time because I didn't have many friends. Um, and I don't know if any of you can relate. You all look very cool and popular. Um, but yeah, I used to go to the library and I would read books and then I'd also get very emotionally affected by them. Like I would start crying if a book was sad, or I'd sort of like yelp if something was scary. And there's a librarian who would always have to come over and shush me as a small child. Um, this librarian, her name was Cynthia Ryder, and she and I actually became pretty good friends as I grew up, because I was there pretty much every weekend. And when I was in middle school, she started recommending books to me, and she would sort of put books on hold and save ones that she thought I would like, which I thought was so sweet, right? That's a very thoughtful thing for someone to do. Um, and then, but I guess lasted until one day I got very scandalized by what she was saying. Uh, because I told her, you know, I had read Jane Austen and I loved Jane Austen. I'd read Pride and Prejudice. I thought Mr. Darcy was very handsome. Um, and she said, you have to read Jane Eyre. And I was like, oh, okay, what is Jane Eyre like? And I remember this was the first time I'd ever heard an adult use this word. She said, Jane Eyre is much sexier than Jane Austen. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember being like, oh my gosh, we're in a library. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> no, but um, she's doing very well. She retired a few years ago, and so we went, I went back for her retirement party, which is really nice. And it was wonderful because there were so many people my age who had grown up with her, almost, if that makes sense. And so we were all adults, and we felt like little kids around her. Um, yeah, Cynthia's very wonderful. Um, let's see, I uh, am happy to do a mix of things. I normally do stand-up. I might switch and pivot to a reading uh, in a little bit. But uh, yeah, I'm very curious. Are most of the people here, do you live here on the Upper East Side? No, it's, yeah. I saw a couple people raise their hand. Awesome. I feel like I'm a teacher. Um, yeah? Okay, cool. That's exciting. I am very rarely up here. I live in Brooklyn. Um, the last time I was up here, I was here by accident because I thought this was the Upper West Side. <laughs> and I got up here and I was like, this doesn't really look like you've got mail. <laughs> I don't understand. Tom Hanks is nowhere to be seen. Um, so then I had to do the thing where you get off and then walk all the way across Central Park. And then I get there, and then I was too late, so I just went home. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, I was recently in Ohio. I'm not from Ohio, uh, but I went there for a writing residency for about two weeks. And pretty much immediately after I would meet with strangers, they would all compliment me. You know, and I know there's a stereotype about people from Ohio being super nice, so I was like, oh, this makes sense. But they would all give me the same compliment, which is they would look me in the eye and say, wow, you are so good at English. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be like, oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> what? You and I are both masters of our native language. <laughs> and so then we bonded. It was really nice. Um, it was actually genuinely very nice um, because I studied English in college. And so this was the first time my degree got any recognition. <laughs> Not for here. This room actually, um, I don't, yeah, I went to Harvard and this room reminds me of college. It's sort of like, it is beautiful, but there are like fake candles when there could just be real lights, you know what I mean? Um, and then there's lots of stuff that I am not allowed to touch. I feel like I went through college being told, don't touch the things around you. Um, and then I eventually graduated and left. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, since I'm uh, getting back from Ohio, I've been doing a number of different things. Uh, have you guys, does anyone here know about this thing called The Wing? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm a freelancer, which really just means I can't keep a day job. And um, uh, it, it, freelancing, I feel like, is now a routine part of people my age, where after you graduate, you freelance for a little bit in the field of you know what you want to do, and then eventually you sort of lose hope and then do something else. <laughs> so right now, if you're like, why does Karen look so happy? It's because I'm still in my freelancing stage. 
But the wing is a place that's exclusively for freelancers, and it's actually, it's just for women. Um, so it's sort of created as a space where if you are someone who, let's say, is like a, an independent contractor, or you know, an architect or whatever, a writer like me, you can go in there, you pay a certain amount of money every month, and uh, you get a free workspace, and like Wi-Fi, and networking events, and things like that. Um, which sounded very cool, and so I looked into applying until I saw that they self-describe their workspaces as witch COVIDs. <laughs> and I was just sort of like, I already have enough white friends. <laughs> I don't know if I want more. Wow, you know, I really wasn't sure if that joke was gonna land here. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I'm gonna turn around, that's my friend Alex in the back. <laughs> that I will uh, completely fail, but that's okay. You've got to know if Asian people still funny, even if I'm not. <laughs> Have you guys seen the movie Crazy Rich Asians? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, it's a really good movie. Um, I have two things about it. Uh, <laughs> one is uh, I thought it was fantastic. I heard they're already working on the sequel, which I'm excited about, um, mainly because it's going to be about my family. It's called Crazy Middle Class Asians. <laughs> And it stars my family having fun at Costco. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my parents uh, went to see Crazy Rich Asians together. They still live back home in San Francisco. And they both, they look kind of like me. We're all the same height, which I think is adorable. Um, and um, my dad still has a huge crush on my mom. And they've been married for, I think, like 32 years, maybe. And so my dad, is, his personality is that of like a golden retriever. And so he's very sweet and very earnest and like very happy. Um, a fun thing he does is if I'm if we're driving together and I accidentally guide him incorrectly and he takes a wrong turn, instead of getting mad, he'll just say like, "That's okay, cars don't get tired." <laughs> <laughs> I think that like sort of captures him perfectly. So that's my dad. Um, my mom is very cool. She like only says what needs to be said, and she'll just tell you in as few words as she needs. So I'll just I'll be like, "Do I look nice?" And she'll be like, "Oh no." <laughs> okay, and then I'll just sort of keep trying until it's, you know, whatever she thinks is good. Um, but a very cute thing that happened was my dad bought movie tickets to see Crazy Rich Asians, and apparently, during the time he went from buying the tickets, bringing them home to see my mom and asking if she wanted to see this movie, he got very nervous about asking her on a date. Um, and keep in mind, they've been married for 31 years. And so he goes home and he asks her, and my mom tells me that he got very shy to quietly slid the tickets across and went, Eunice, would you want to go to this movie with me? And my mom was like, yes. <laughs> anyway, that's the end of that story. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read a, a piece really quickly. Um, I think I am about halfway through in time, so I'm just going to end with this. This is a story. Uh, it is 100% based on the fact I am terrified of almost everything, um, to the point where things that should actually be scary to me are so far off that I'm not afraid of them. Does that make sense? Um, so when people talk about like murder or, I don't know, really scary things, I'm just sort of like, ah, that won't ever happen to me because I will have something crazy happen first. So this is a piece I wrote for The New Yorker, and it is called Horror Movies Based on My Actual Fears. So these are names of movies, and I'm gonna do a quick description of them. This first one is called Silence of the Cars. I have to walk for more than two minutes through a dark parking lot to get to my own car. Nothing happens, and I reach my car safely, but the John Williams score swells and heightens the suspense. So I start running, my eyes darting around, a sacred nightly ritual of single womanhood. The second one is um, called Drafted. Uh, does anyone here have a Twitter? Okay, cool. Um, so we're gonna skip this one and go on. This one is called The Room. Um, my Lyft driver looks like he's about to take the longer route, which has heavy traffic. I don't know how to tell him this politely because I realize it's his job and because of my inherent crippling need to please. The entire film takes place in the moment just before he has to merge lanes and turn left. <laughs> we never learn what happens because I sweat about two gallons and then die of dehydration. <laughs> the next movie is called The Exercise. <laughs> I'm about to go for a run, and when I realize I've forgotten my earphones, I have to exercise without them, which leaves me no choice but to listen to my own thoughts. 
I end up pondering the importance of life and the beauty of nature without distraction from whatever pop song Spotify has deemed freaky disco. I'll explain that later. Um, and I end up feeling physically and mentally refreshed, a terrifying state of being. The next one is called Lost in Translation. My phone autocorrects all exclamation marks to periods, and people misinterpret my text as cold and snarky. <laughs> my friend gets mad at me for writing, how fun. My parents disown me for texting, thanks for the ham. <laughs> my husband divorces me for sending, I want a divorce. <laughs> Everyone hates me. Um, okay, the next one is called A Fear of Oneself. I finally consume so much toxic media that I begin to internalize misogyny. I'm a self-objectified cog with curves in the masculine machine. I stress about being overweight, talking shrill, and taking up too much space. I become incapable of saying the phrase, I want my period, out loud. Um, the next one is called The Shouldering. This is a psychological thriller in which I'm a burden to everyone I know. <laughs> Despite my greatest efforts to be chill, I'm a terrible nuisance and frustratingly type A. The worst part is that I cannot tell if I'm imagining this, and the speculation is what ultimately drives me insane. <laughs> the last movie is called Forced. It's very simple. My friend forced me to watch an actual horror movie, and I cannot sleep for weeks. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've been here to you. Washington Heights, 
being, having bed bugs and their lives were upended. And um, I'd be lying in bed just wondering, oh my gosh, is there a bug about to latch onto my body? <laughs> and then I'd start thinking, what does that bug look like? <coughs> it always looked like Bradley Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you keep staring at me? I can't help but stare. I was all over you last night. You bit me, didn't you? Ooh la la. You have the sweetest blood. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. I'm calling the super. <laughs> I love you. Uh, guess what, handsome? I loathe and despise you. We can work through that. <laughs> You've been spotted, and that for you is the end. Well. We all need to find our place in this world, and I like it here. I think you do too. Uh, yes, I like it here. I, I live in apartment 11B. You don't. Well, actually, I do live here, and I don't want to leave. You will soon be long gone. Faster than a boyfriend with a midlife crisis, and a crush on his 22-year-old girlfriend and intern who dresses like a, oh, I can't believe he broke up with me. Well, you mustn't be alone, my daffodil. Daffodil? I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats <laughs> on high or veils and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Oh, words worth. Oh, great. Another romantic playing on my literary side. I'm not falling for it. You know, I love the final stanza. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Oh, I love that too. What can I do to gain your trust? I'm not ready for this. Oh, my neck, I want to scratch. No, no, I, uh, I don't want you to get an infection. Oh no, you carry disease? <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I'm disease free. I just don't want you to suffer. Stay away from me. No problem. After sucking on your blood last night, I won't be hungry for a year. Sweetheart, you satisfy me. <laughs> I was that good? Delicious. Where did you come from, anyway? Well, kingdom Animalia, phylum Arthropoda, class Insecta, order Hemiptera. Oh, too much information. Okay, I'm from the Chinchine family. Early 1800s. Very aristocratic, if uh, that's important to you. But how did you get here? I mean, wait, you didn't come with that pseudo-academic from the Upper West Side? <laughs> right before I started dating? No, no, no. The community moved in uh, five or six tenants ago. Before you were even born, sweetie. Thing is, you can never get rid of us. <laughs> we will find a way back. I think we can find a way to work this out to our mutual satisfaction. <laughs> but, but you're a... Uh, I can't even say it. Oh, no, we can't work it out. I'm calling the super right now. Word will get out. Bed bugs in apartment 11B. People will think you're unclean. You'll never get invited to parties. No, okay. Ex exterminators are gonna come and... You know, and, and then what? Chaos in the building? And then they jack up your rent for all the bother you're causing? I didn't invite you here. That's so unfair. Sweetheart, New York landlords are the real problem. Never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Why haven't I noticed you before? I, I've been here for seven years. Oh, you have a wonderful box room. Uh, I've been here for seven years. <laughs> Dark, warm, very cozy, and we all love it. We? How, how many? How many like you? Well, if you count. Both the adults and the nymphs. Well, let's see, the newborn nymphs will be adults in four weeks, but there are more being made all the time. I've lost track. Doesn't matter. The others are content. I'm the one that wants to live freely by your side, never to leave you. Uh, you know, I can't get into another relationship this soon. <laughs> Something happened last night. I got very close to you. I wanted to be near you. Do I smell almonds? That's me. 
<laughs> Caring about you. Get a whiff of this. Oh, raspberry. Mm. Raspberries and almonds. Innately comforting. Oh, I can't do this. Why not? What's the matter? I'm, af I'm afraid you're going to fly away like the others. But I'm not like the others. Then prove it. Well, look at me. Wingless. I'm a parasite with no wings. I'm like a no-fly zone, baby. <laughs> Why do I have such bad luck with men? Well, I could have told you that Tom from Boca wasn't a real pilot. <laughs> you know, you should judge these men by their actions, not by their slippery language. Hey, you want to watch uh, You've Got Mail or When Harry Met Sally? Oh, really? You do that with me? You see? Judge me by my actions, darling. Although I wouldn't mind seeing War of the Worlds. I have to admit, you're very handsome. Girl, you are hot. <laughs> oh, you don't think his outfit makes me look fat? You? No way. Never. No. Oh, wait, are, are you my rebound relationship? Is this going to land with a thud? Are you married? Separated? In the middle of an excruciatingly painful divorce? Okay. Okay, I admit there are conditions. Oh, I knew it. Put it on the table, now or no deal. No plastic or hyperallergenic zipper covers on the mattress or pillows. <laughs> no heavy duty vacuuming. No glue boards or sticky tape. Oh, sweetheart, don't look so frightened. I have tasted you, Daffodil, and it is the taste of springtime. Call off the super. And that's a taste of under my box. <laughs> Victoria Frankenlove. <laughs> All circuits functioning. Sensors detecting heat, light, sound, desire. Solar panels good. Final check complete. Maximus, you are ready. Ready for what, my sweet? A kiss that lasts forever? <laughs> Maximus, there's something I need to tell you. Tell me everything. Why do you think they call me Mr. Wonderful? Oh, I love that line. It is from my heart. Well, actually, it's from my heart. But, oh my goodness, she's going to be here in three minutes. Maximus, the last nine months have been the most productive time of my life. Look at you. I created you. But now you belong to Bunny. <laughs> Bunny? <laughs> Bunny, your new girlfriend. She's arriving any minute now. Clarification, please. A woman of means who's been dreaming of the perfect relationship. She's had plenty of experience, mostly with scoundrels after her money. I solved the boyfriend problem. I solved you like a puzzle. I love puzzles. I know. I know you do. I based you on my extensive research of dolls. Social, playful, highly intelligent, quick studies, ability to mimic. You have a large, complicated dolphin brain with input from what Bunny wants and drawing on my own personal <clears throat> needs and desires. You are the ideal boyfriend. I tweaked your commitment gene to assure continuous delirium for romance. Besame, besame mucho. Yes, you can sing the most romantic boleros in the world. You play the guitar. And... Recite poetry. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose. Oh, that's newly sprung in June. Robert Burns, of course. You have solved the boyfriend problem, problem for one lucky woman. Victoria, I want to solve your problems. Not necessary. I'll be stuck in dolphin research for a long time. You are going home. I want to go home with you. 
Maximus, you belong to Bunny. I've sold you for a lot of money. I, I love you. Love? No, no, not love. Science cannot solve the problem of the aching heart. Do not speak of love. It's not in the contract. Dr. Frankenlove, my hard drive is about to crash. No, no, don't crash. I already spent the down payment. You have to function perfectly. How will you function tonight when I'm with her? I'll work. I'll work late. I'm experimenting on useful robots for practical application in society. Maybe I'll take on global warming. Are those tears? I want to comfort you. You're programmed to say that. I want to ease your pain. I want to be with you forever. I'm sorry. I needed the money. My grant wasn't renewed. I couldn't say no to the richest woman on the Upper East Side. <laughs> this is goodbye. If this is goodbye, then I'm shutting down. Do not shut down. I have to run and check. Check in, check in, check in. <laughs> I'm sorry your lab partner stole your idea and cheated you out of a promotion and a grant. That was years ago. I want you to stop dating jerks. How do you know about my dating life? I wish you were not going out with Mr. OK Cupid tomorrow night. He is affable and charming, but his intelligent quotient is far below yours. Maximus, how do you know this? I am in your system. You created me. I absorbed everything. Your emails, your online shopping and dating habits, <laughs> checks paid. Credit card balances, savings accounts, bra size 34C, dress size, petite. Delete me! My personal information cannot go with you. You have to forget me. I will never forget you. I love you. This is a system error. I did not create a pathway between my life and yours. And I did not program love. You are forgetting something. Reveal error. Fifty million years ago, my ancestors walked off the land and into the sea. I remember walking, then deep sea diving. I am everything from sweet bottle nose to killer whale. It's the nerves bundle in the center of your brain. Knows you better than you know yourself, Victoria. My systematic programming makes today's big data look like something in a kindergarten class. I am into individual data, baby. Your data. Delete my data. Like you, I get choked up at the resonant sounds of the Boccello sweets. I laugh at a baby's gurgle. I snicker at the long list of side effects on Viagra commercials. In oceanic waters, I chase the tail. Back on ground, I respond to a profound set of visual and other stimuli that make me want to dig my hands in the dirt and throw a lance at a running animal and to fall hopelessly in love in pursuit of what I want and desire. I am not just another robot. No, you are not. And that's all the time we have. <laughs> <laughs>
reflection from, um, I, I just, I, I, that was an impromptu title, much more fun than regular charades. So this is from uh, an essay in my book, The Unspeakable, that's called Invisible City. And I'm so happy to, to be standing um, in front of adults here because I had to stop reading this essay to college students because it involves um, some, some famous names and people that I just thought were household names. And eventually I realized that they had no idea who I was talking about. <laughs> um, and so not to insult any of you here, but um, I, uh, I think you might recognize some of the names. And if you don't, just, just stop me. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what do you need to know here? This is, um, yeah, this is actually an essay about Los Angeles and about the idea of, of invisibility. Um, uh, but this is about a, a particular uh, experience I had uh, with, a, with a group of people. So, um, and also the third mention of, of Nora Ephron in, uh, in three, we are three, three for three. So I'm not gonna talk about you of male specifically. Uh, but this is about Nora Ephron, so. Nora Ephron was a friend and a mentor to me. I use these terms proudly, but also loosely, as she was a friend and a mentor to dozens, if not hundreds, of other young female writers of roughly my generation and sensibility. When she died unexpectedly in the summer of 2012, we all seemed to come out of the woodwork like mistresses at the funeral of a raging yet irresistible philanderer, churning out tributes to her in any publication that would let us, and sizing one another up as if saying, she took you to lunch too? <laughs> Even before then, I knew I was far from the first rung of Nora Acolytes. We had lunch a few times, once or twice in New York. Next time I'll invite Joan to join us, she said, meaning Joan Didion. And once or twice again in LA, where on one occasion she told me to meet her at Fred Siegel. And not realizing it had a restaurant, I loitered around the store for 20 minutes before figuring things out and rushing to the cafe, where, to my great shame, I had kept her waiting. A movie producer Nora knew was seated at a nearby table, and she introduced us. This was during a time when I was still going through the motions of trying to be a screenwriter, a venture Nora seemed eager to help with. Returning to our table, she said to me, you are going to call him tomorrow, and he will take a meeting with you, and he will love you, and you'll do a project together, and it will work. <coughs> she said things like this all the time to just about everybody. <laughs> anyway, this is where the real story begins. I did not get it on tape, so I can't be claimed to telling it verbatim. But I am recounting it to the best of my ability. And if at any time I appear to be exaggerating, you can be assured that, that I am not. So one day, Nora emailed me and said she wanted to invite me to a party for a games kind of thing. Though I loathe games of just about any sort, I of course accepted the invitation. A short time later, her assistant faxed me the directions. That's another thing that college students don't understand. Fax, the directions. So I'm dating, I'm like aging before you. Fax, I had a fax machine at this time in my house. She faxed me the directions to her house which included a map and also instructions to bring a written list of objects or titles or names that were linked in some fashion. For instance, A League of Their Own, Field of Dreams, The Natural, which are all movies about baseball. I spent no less than 20 hours working on my list, revising it endlessly, changing the theme multiple times, and just generally fretting about the party. I ended up with a list of rock bands that had birds in the name. The eagles, the yard birds, a flock of seagulls, and so on. But that's not really relevant to the story. When I arrived at Nora's house, there were only a handful of cars in the driveway. A Lexus or two, a Range Rover, some BMWs, and very few parked on the street. This surprised me, as I assumed it would be a large gathering. Otherwise, why in the world would I have made the cut? I rang the doorbell, and Nora answered, greeting me warmly, as always. Though she lived in New York most of the time, she was in LA directing the movie Bewitched, and the house, which I think she was renting with her husband, Nick Pelleggi, was grand, if also fairly modest in scale. A baby grand house. She showed me into the living room, where about 20 people, drinks and hors d'oeuvres in hand, were standing around in small conversational huddles. Okay, here, here you go. Just stop me if you have never heard of these people. These people included the following. Nicole Kidman. <laughs> Meg Ryan. Steve, 
Steve Martin, Rob Reiner. Yes, okay. That to them, the college students, that is like an obscure reference. Rob, Rob Reiner, that's what we'd say, like, you know, some obscure French theorists they would know, more likely to know. Okay, Rob Reiner, Larry David, Ariana Huffington, and David Geffen. David Geffen, the famous, you know, producer, record and film producer. Others included the spouses or partners of these people. For instance, Lori David who was still married to Larry at the time, and Steve Martin's lovely young girlfriend and future wife, the former New Yorker fact checker, Anne Stringfield. There was a smattering of various producers and moguls I didn't recognize, plus, of course, Nick Pileggi, a famed author and screenwriter in his own right. There was also a small dog and some stealth hired hands in the kitchen. Nora introduced me to Nicole Kidman. The way she did this was to say, Nicole, this is Megan Dom. Megan, this is Nicole Kidman. Then she brought me over to Rob Reiner and did the same thing. Another guest pulled her away, and I was left standing there with Rob Reiner, who seemed to be listening to the side in an effort to return to his previous conversation. <laughs> he said nothing to me. I couldn't think of one appropriate thing to say to him. Obviously, I couldn't ask what he did for a living or how he knew Nora. Everyone in the world knew that he was a famous director, and anyone with a scintilla of movie trivia knowledge knew that he went back with Nora at least as far as when Harry met Sally, for which she wrote the script. Do you live nearby? I asked finally. <laughs> kind of, he said. Have any trouble getting here? <laughs> nope, he said. We stood there a while longer. Rob Reiner didn't ask if I lived nearby, or how I knew Nora, or what I did for a living. He asked me nothing. I excused myself to get a drink. Clutching my wine, I scanned the room for anyone remotely approachable. Steve Martin. I walked over and said hello. More precisely, I walked over and said hello to Anne, who then made it okay to say hello to Steve. He was friendlier than Rob Reiner, though no doubt this was because of Anne, who I'd never met, but who at least occupied the same social galaxy as I did. Or at least she had before she went and realized the fantasy of every woman who ever majored in English or worked in publishing <laughs> to land a major movie star who also plays the banjo and writes shouts and murmurs poems. <laughs> Steve Martin had a weird little mustache. It turned out he was in the middle of shooting a remake of the Pink Panther, playing Inspector Clouseau, and he couldn't shave it off. Larry David was standing with him, and I tried to talk to him too, but his gaze soon shifted to some person or object behind me, registering the bored irritation of a wedding guest trapped next to someone's mentally ill relative. <laughs> Mercifully, Nora clanked a glass and announced that dinner was ready. She cooked everything herself, baked ham and green beans and salad. The food sat on the kitchen counter in giant aluminum pans, and we were instructed to file through and serve ourselves. Out in the main room, the seating was haphazard, with guests spread out over several tables that had been pushed together at strange angles. The spots were getting snatched up rapidly, and I grabbed one where I could, which turned out to be next to Meg Ryan, who <coughs> said hello with maximum brevity. <coughs> and she proceeded to start a conversation with the guy on the other side of me. Like just about everyone else, they were talking politics. Weeks earlier, George W. Bush had been elected to a second term. They were all very distraught about this. At the other end of the table, Rob Reiner was booming with indignation about voting booth fraud. Ariana Huffington was gesturing wildly as though debating someone on a talk show. <laughs> Meg Ryan and her friend were in deep discussion about how best to go after the Bush administration for war crimes. When I piped up, if only to lessen the awkwardness of our seating arrangement, they gave no indication of hearing me. I never thought I'd say this, but the words, now we're going to divide into teams and play charades, filled me with indescribable relief. <laughs> Nora told us to get out our lists and drop them in a hat that was being passed around. Then she explained that this was a special kind of charade, called running charades. It's much more fun than regular charades, she said. So what you're saying then, said Steve Martin, is that it's sort of fun. <laughs> he said this neither loudly nor quietly, though few seemed to hear him in any case. 
We broke into teams, each of which was assigned a captain. Rob Reiner was ours, and he explained the rules, which essentially involved trying to elicit as many correct answers as quickly as possible. The clues were the lists, meaning someone would stand out and act out every item on it, the eagles, the yardbirds, a flock of seagulls, until the theme was identified. Then they'd move on to another list. The first team to work through all the lists was the winner. Rob Reiner was a taskmaster. Let's go, let's go, he bellowed, while we flailed around, trying to convey titles like The Kiss of the Spider Woman and The Crying Game. It seemed almost everyone had only brought in lists of movies, only to be met with shouts of, A Beautiful Mind, Boogie Nights. I couldn't help but notice that Anne and I and a few of the other non-actors were in heavier pantomime rotation than the professional performers in the room, namely Nicole Kidman who had confessed early that charades is not my forte, and was now sitting on an ottoman in the corner, seemingly trying to avoid notice, which is, of course, a fruitless endeavor if you are Nicole Kidman. <laughs> I need to pause to say a few things about Nicole Kidman. First of all, she is stunningly beautiful. She is beautiful in a non-human way. She is an ethereal willow tree of a woman with skin by Vermeer and hair by Botticelli. The other celebrities were, of course, also much better looking than normal people. Ariana Huffington was tall and sleek in jeans and a crisp shirt. David Geffen, who I could never think of anything other as other than the free man in Paris after the song Joni Mitchell wrote about him, was fit and tan and affable looking. But Nicole Kidman was in another league entirely her hair a cascade of shiny blondness that managed to at once be tousled and perfectly in place. If she didn't happen to look so very real, you'd think she must be fake. She was that gorgeous. And so I said nothing to her. I said nothing to anyone. And as the evening wore on, I said hardly anything, not out of insecurity, but actually out of a strange peace. I entered a kind of zen space a pact with my ego, in which I realized that, as bizarre and slightly awful as this evening was, it was also a dream come true. I was, in effect, invisible. I was the human embodiment of a fly on the wall. Who among us has not wished for that experience? How many of us wonder what it would be like, if only for an hour or two, to observe a situation both in person and at a vast distance? A situation, no less, involving movie stars waving their hands around while people shouted, the French lieutenant's woman, Greece, Schindler's List. <laughs> one problem with the charades game, at least among our team, was that no one listened to anyone. And therefore, when someone did call out the right answer, it often went unrecognized. This happened to me as I yelled, Gorky Park, at least three times <laughs> until Steve Martin spoke on my behalf and the message was received. The event dragged on and on, Rob Reiner and Larry David growing so impatient with many of the players that they finally gave in and assumed the bulk of the evening's remaining pantomime duties. I don't know what this is, Larry David said, looking, looking at a clue and throwing up his hands as if it were written in hieroglyphics. I thought for a moment that he'd gotten my list and he didn't know where to start with the yard birds. But that was impossible, since we were only using lists supplied by members of the other teams. Larry David began jumping around, stomping on the floor, covering his ears as though shielding them from a loud noise. Flash dance, we cried out. Footloose. All that jazz, Rob Reiner roared. Arthur, my left foot, close encounters of the third kind. Come on, people, just keep it going. Come on, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Finally, someone got thunder. Blue thunder, rolling thunder. Thunderheart? Mad Max beyond Thunderdome? Then, at last, days of thunder. Yes, said Larry David, though I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, really, days of thunder, said Rob Reiner. What the hell is that, said Larry David. Is that a movie? I never heard of it. There was a murmuring in the crowd. Evidently, no one else had heard of the movie either. In the corner, Nicole Kidman sat quietly <laughs> staring at the rug. <laughs> Though it hardly seemed possible, no one realized that this was a movie Nicole herself had starred in. <laughs> in 1990, with her then husband, Tom Cruise. It was set in the world of NASCAR, and 
for some reason I remember there was a single associated with it called Show Me Heaven, performed by the singer Maria McKee, formerly of the cow punk country rock band Lone Justice. But this did not seem worth mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the Vermeer spoke. It's a race car movie, she said. Actually, she said, it's a race car movie, in her Australian accent. Not everyone heard her, but those who did were still unable to place it. A race car movie, said Larry David. You mean like Cannonball Run? No, more like whatever, said Nicole, waving her hand in dismissal. She pronounced whatever as what either. <laughs> well, that's the first I've heard of it, said Larry David. I never saw Nicole Kidman again. My novel was never made into a movie. I never did a project with the producer Nora introduced me to at Fred Siegel, mostly because I never bothered to call him. Instead, I kept doing essays and journalism and eventually became a columnist at the Los Angeles Times. The screenwriting world was lively and seductive in ways, but it also felt desperate and slightly sad, as though it was made up of all the people you knew in high school who were pretty smart, but not the smartest. You know what, said Nora, who would once been a columnist herself. You're not a screenwriter, you're a columnist. It was the highest compliment she could have paid me. A few years after the party at Nora's house, I found myself at a party at Ariana Huffington's house. This time, it was a huge gathering with easily 100 guests, few if any of whom were famous as far as I could tell. I'd been writing my newspaper column for a year or so at that point, and although I'd met Ariana in passing since the charades party, she'd never fully registered who I was or what I did. But now a mutual friend brought me into her circle where a flock of reporters and bloggers and other columnists were cackling away. Actually, we played charades together at Nora's, I said, when the friend introduced us. Megan's a columnist at the LA Times, the friend said. I'm sure you've read her. Oh, yes, said Ariana. You're really good. One of the best. It was a savor the moment kind of moment, like when Nora told me I was not a screenwriter, but a columnist. Everything eventually comes together, I thought. Eventually, we all shake out into the thing we were supposed to be all along. Oh my, I said to Ariana, thank you. I mean, it's not easy, she said, playing that kind of charades. I really think you were one of the better players. <laughs> Uh, 
you might greet it with silence. Um, uh, but whenever she uh, is doing something, we just call it um, celebrating Christmas. <laughs> it, just, it just makes it nice and joyful, uh, you know? And you might wonder why exactly, why exactly that phrase. And the reason is uh, because, you know, our, our whole lives, Vanessa and myself, we were told that you haven't really experienced Christmas until you see it through the eyes of a child. <laughs> to see the expression that comes upon a child's face as they are experiencing Christmas is to see an expression that you've never before seen in your entire life. And it is an expression that will spread uh, cheer and joy uh, throughout the entire household. Uh, similarly, when our daughter, Eliadora, is celebrating Christmas, she wears an expression that I have never before seen in my life. And it spreads joy and good cheer throughout our entire household. Because this expression that she wears when she celebrates, it's Hilarious! Uh, it's it's really indescribable, all right. But uh, you, uh, you imagine the tiny little dollop of a human being who is wearing an expression of like utter bafflement. You know, a, an expression that seems to say, "Good God, what now?" You know, <laughs> and this coming from a little creature whose like baseline cognitive experience of the world is deep confusion, right? So for this experience to merit a whole new expression of its own really speaks to exactly how remarkable it must be. Like literally, she is having an out-of-body experience. <laughs> and whenever she is celebrating her life, we will yell to each other across the apartments. Vanessa will be like, oh my god, Martin, come quick! Christmas is coming early, and then I'll run, and we will watch the look on her face. And it must be weird for her daughter, because not only does she have this very bizarre experience, but the only two people she knows in the world are looking at her deeply in her own eyes as she's doing it, and uh, laughing, right? <laughs> so three weeks ago, this is a very recent experience, it's all very recent, she's only 20 uh, weeks old. So three weeks ago, I was in Vancouver at the Vancouver Fringe Festival. Uh, and we've been, uh, this past summer, we traveled for two and a half months between fringe festivals across the continent. We left Brooklyn when our daughter was six weeks old, and uh, a few weeks, and, and now she's just past uh, four months old. And uh, I've gone to Vancouver Fringe many times, I'm performing a uh, one-person show there, and uh, I've made friends there. And so uh, we have this friend Julie, we meet up with her when we get there, and she does um, what seemingly is the appropriate thing to do when a friend of yours has had a baby. She gives us a gift, which um, uh, you might uh, think is thoughtful, but is not actually when you are traveling for months across the continent. And like me, my whole life, I have uh, prided myself on being able to travel with just a backpack and a couple t-shirts and a pair of jeans in it. And now we are traveling with so much stuff that like we have to pack it all in a small plane outside our plane <laughs> as we travel between cities. So when she gives us this gift, like my heart sinks on the inside, but I gotta be like, oh wow, it's so thoughtful, you know? And, and made worse when we open up the gift, and uh, it's something that uh, not only do we already own, but we in fact have it with us as we are opening the present. It is a baby carrier. And um, we're very happy with our baby carrier. It is a nylon, it is blue, it is comfortable. And this uh, baby carrier is, um, like it's either looks homemade or it's been so exquisitely made by a factory to look homemade. Uh, it is made out of cloth. <coughs> It is a sort of sack with two holes at the bottom for legs to go into. And then what sort of uh, what makes me feel strange uh, more than anything is that on the front there is something that I don't know if it's offensive because I've lost track of what is and is not offensive in our day and age. But there is a, a small girl kneeling in front of a stream and she is a Native American. And, um, or as you might say in Canada, she's First Nations. 
and she's wearing some kind of little brown dress. She's wearing moccasins. She's got a feather coming out of her hair. And like right, up, right away, I'm like, I don't like either. I'm too sensitive, or I'm not sensitive enough. <laughs> like, the only thing I'm comfortable wearing on my clothes right now are, are, are white men. Like that's the only thing I know. While I'm not appropriating anybody's heritage, I'm not making light of genocide or anything. And so as soon as we leave, Julia, I just uh, Vanessa, and I look at each other, and we're like. She's never wearing this. You know what I mean? <laughs> and she's like, absolutely. Cut to a week later, and we were getting together with Julie, and Vanessa and I looked at each other, and we're like, we gotta wear it. No, we, we gotta put it on. And I'm the one who has to uh, uh, put it on, because I will be carrying Eliodora, because we're getting together with Julie, because I insisted that uh, Vanessa go to a fringe theater show, you know? Uh, she's been stuck with the baby all the time, and so we meet up with Julie, we have some food at the market, and then uh, they're gonna go out to see a show, and, and Vanessa's very nervous uh, to leave me alone with, with the little girl, and I'm like, it's only going to be an hour. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> She's like, I'll leave my phone on. I'm like, you're actually going to be in a room where they will explicitly ask you not to do that. Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. I'm going to stay right here on Granville Island, which is where the Fringe Festival happens in Vancouver. It's a beautiful, uh, small island. And so she goes off, goes off to the show with Julie. And I'm there with, with my little girl. And I'm sort of excited. I'm like, all right, we're just going to have a fine time. Because uh, it's become a little bit easier to amuse her. Not only has she been smiling uh, readily, but she's also just recently begun to laugh. Uh, there's only one thing she apparently finds funny in the entire world. Like everything's just like confusion, and then like, oh, funny, and then back to confusion. <laughs> and that's it. Vanessa and I look at her and then just go, boo. And then she will laugh, and won't laugh in the way that we laugh, She'll just look back at us and go, huh. <laughs> in any other context, it's a very sarcastic response. But like for Vanessa and myself, we become pathetic, trying to draw out this like, sarcastic sounding laughter from this little girl, trying to say boo in the right way. And a lot of times, like, mm, didn't say it right, didn't say it right, didn't say it right. And then every now and then, huh. you know? So I'm walking around the little island with her, and I'm like, well, I want to, you know, I'm gonna, at some point, I'm gonna make her laugh. And I, but it's not long into the hour, into my little walk, where all of a sudden I am reminded of what I ate in the market, which is a cream of a chicken soup. And the thing is, I love anything made of cream, but my body does not. And I know this, but I'm an eternal optimist. Decades of my life, I will sit down and I'll be like, give me the cream. And decades of my life, it does not work out physically. But I'm always hoping, I'm like, today's going to be the time. But I'm reminded, as suddenly my bowels feel like, whoop, there's some sort of expansion going on there. I'm like, oh my god. Oh my god, no, 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 no. And I realize, you know, it's like that feeling you get like the day after Halloween when you go outside and all of a sudden there are Christmas decorations being put up and all the light poles and in the stores you're like, no, 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 not Christmas now, not Christmas. We are not celebrating Christmas now, no. And you realize, oh God, God, we're celebrating Christmas, man. And like, I'm frantically now, uh, you know, looking like, as you would if you haven't gone Christmas shopping, you know, and it's the day before Christmas, so you're frantically walking around the, uh, the island looking for some place where, where I can appropriately celebrate the holidays, you know, and uh, I find a theater, and I go into the lobby, and, uh, and I'm like, all right, I just got to take care of this, man, you know, and in Vancouver, very liberal town, uh, the bathrooms are co-ed, and I totally support bathrooms being co-ed, but, but personally, I have no experience with co-ed bathrooms, and I frankly, I don't know if I really believe that, are they really co-ed? You know what I mean? I imagine they recently became co-ed, but everybody who lives here probably knows which one is actually the woman's bathroom, which one is actually the man's bathroom, and I'm very afraid to make the wrong decision, particularly because I'm going to go in and celebrate Christmas in a way that it could be very untoward for anyone that's in there. I pick a, I pick a bathroom, I walk on inside, uh, I choose the right one, there's some urinals there, uh, and there's some men in there. And I'm too embarrassed to go into the stall because I, you know, I, it just seems wrong with this little baby strapped to my front with her arms going all like Kimbo and a little Native American girl sitting so classically in the stream. And so I go to a, a faucet and I'm washing my hands and, and people are, oh, how beautiful the baby is and trying to make small talk with me. And I'm being very rude because I don't want to make small talk when everyone just leave, you know. And, I'm, and I look like I have OCD with how much I'm washing my hands. 
And so finally, all the men leave, and so they should. They're not crazy. They don't live here. And, uh, and I go into a stall all by myself, and I lock the stall, and I drop my pants, and I'm like, oh, like logistically, how is this supposed to work? As I realize that if I were to sit down now, there are little legs that might find their way in new places that would be inappropriate, to say the least. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I, I could hold the legs up, you know, but I know that I, uh, I'm not sure I want to celebrate Christmas with another person sitting on my lap. Uh, so I'm like, that's it. They take off the little carrier, you know, and then I'm like, okay, what, uh, what to do uh, now, you know? Uh, and I'm like, well, maybe I just hold her <laughs> above my head like she's some kind of boombox, you know? <laughs> letting the world know I'm in a Nora Ephron movie, letting the world know how much I love Christmas. Uh, and it's then when I notice that the back of the stall door, do you guys know what that little hook is for? I always thought it was for coats or bags. Turns out it's for putting a baby on when you just gotta celebrate Christmas. <laughs> this little carrier, for all I've been deriding, it's got a little hook on the back, and I'm able to hook her onto this little thing, and then I keep my hand on her as I lower myself down onto the seat, and then it's, it's just an explosion of good cheer, guys. And it's just like Santa Claus has come to town, you know, he's dropped down the chimney, his bag has exploded all over the living room with presents everywhere and uh, you know and, and there at the other end of my arm is my daughter just looking at me deeply in the eyes you know, uh, as I am exhibiting an expression of relief and panic uh, and embarrassment surely an expression that uh, she has never seen before in her life uh, and, and it would be, it'd be wonderful if the story sort of ended here, you know, father and daughter celebrating Christmas together, <laughs> privately, uh, having a special moment, looking at each other in the eyes, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't end here because she is uh, my daughter and she does have the same genetic makeup as me and every father perhaps wants to inspire their children, though I wish I hadn't in that moment because uh, <laughs> Because as I'm celebrating Christmas, as the, as the Christmas bells are ringing, uh, it, it is amplified by the sound of the porcelain, and it is uh, not unlike a sound of um, boo. So she <laughs> is looking at me, and then just begins to go, <laughs> 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 and is laughing at me in a way that is uh, sort of saying to me, um, uh, yeah, it is uh, better to give than receive. You know, and acknowledging that this moment is pretty funny until all of a sudden that expression changes to an expression I know all too well, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 don't do it now, don't do it now, and then all of a sudden father and daughter are celebrating Christmas together. All right, in this in this moment, having a real moment. Uh, so I'm done, and I, I clean up all the wrapping paper, uh, you know, and um, uh, pull up my pants, and then I'm like, ah. You know, got this little girl on the hook, um, and every parent has been there. Everyone has this moment of being in the public place when you're like, what am I going to do with this stocking that is filled with Christmas presents and uh, a little baby head sticking out of the front uh, top of it because she has, um, Christmas is sort of all shot upside her backside, right? So it is, it is just a mess in this little burrito, Christmas burrito with a baby in it. And I take her outside the stall. And uh, it's, it's not a co-ed bathroom because there is no changing table in this room. It is a men's room. I knew it. And so I have to leave the bathroom and go out into the lobby and then go into the other co-ed bathroom, which is the women's bathroom. And I walk inside there. Indeed, uh, there is a changing table in there and I'm able to put it down and, uh, and get to work. Now, every woman that comes in, uh, I feel the need to explain to them um, that I am uh, exactly what I'm doing, as if it is not apparent, you know? <laughs> but what is amazing is while I'm feeling embarrassed and there's, it's, just, it's just a mess, you know, every woman that comes in, the expression on their faces, and I, I knew what they're thinking. They're thinking like, oh, a man, a father, finally changing the diaper of a baby. 
And, and there's those people coming over and oh, it's beautiful, and, and wanting to help, and like handing like paper towels, you know what I mean? And I, I sort of feel like, you know, that I'm being visited by, 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 by kings and queens who are bringing me not, not gifts of incense and, and, and myrrh, and all that type of sense, but like baby wipes and emotional support, which is what I need in that moment. Uh, and, and together, as a community, it takes a village, guys. We, we, clean, up, we clean up the situation, and uh, and everybody uh, sort of leaves, and I'm left alone with her, and and then and this little baby carrier, which I'm I'm, I'm afraid to say this, guys. Particularly, I'm afraid because I, 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 I as a white man, I don't want to defile anything from another culture, and yet I gotta say, um, I threw it out. <laughs> and out, I uh, quietly, quickly threw it out in there. Uh, the silver lining being that, like, um, we didn't have to find an extra room in our luggage on the way home. <laughs> That's my story. Thank you very much. with a friend and she told me, you know, there are a lot of other people who also have your problem. And they actually get out of the home. So you can, you can get out of the house and, and celebrate your problems together. Um, so that got me to a 
kind of um, sort of hippy dippy dancing called Five Rhythms, which again is a form of improvised dance. This one is mostly offered in yoga studios or dance studios, and essentially it is, uh, it's just a teacher who's putting on music of, of varying rhythms um, while she or he uh, is then giving you dance prompts over the PA system. And some of the prompts that these teachers were giving started to strike me as being a little wacky. <laughs> like one night, uh, the teacher gets on the mic and says, give permission to your armpits. <laughs> uh, another, night, another night, the, the prompt was, unreliable spine, unreliable spine. <laughs> Um, so, <clears throat> about a year later, I decided to write a book about dance, uh, which involved tons of research, and it was probably the most fun um, research that I've ever done for a project. I uh, took classes in about 12 different kinds of dance, ballet, hip-hop, jazz, buto. Uh, I read about 20 or 30 biographies of famous choreographers and dancers. Uh, I went to all sorts of performances. And while I was doing all these things, I couldn't let, I couldn't get, um, uh, give permission to your armpits <laughs> out of my head. It just it, it kept sort of haunting me somehow. So I thought it would be fun while doing this research to c start collecting all of the wacky dance instructions that famous choreographers have given to dancers over the years. And so what I've done in this piece that I'm gonna read for you guys, um, which I've never read before, let's hope it doesn't tank, um, but I've picked all my favorite ones and strung them together in a kind of narrative. It's not gonna matter that you won't have heard of a lot of the choreographers. I will tell you though that um, the person who pops up a lot is Martha Graham, who of course was the high priestess of modern dance. Um, both Martha Graham's work and her person were very severe very dramatic. She wore, you know, floor-length black gowns, and she had kind of a death stare. Uh, there's a famous story that at one point in the 30s, she goes down to a college in Texas to give a lecture, and she makes the pronouncement, all great dance comes from the lonely place. And at the end of the lecture, during the Q&A period, of timid young co-ed raises her hand and says, oh, Miss Graham, you, you mentioned that all great dance comes from the lonely place. Where exactly is that? <laughs> and Martha, of course, rises up on her haunches and says, between your legs. Next question. <laughs> so that's Martha. And then um, the one other thing that I'll tell you is there is one obscure reference to betel juice, which is the juice of the betel nut, which is a, the fruit that comes off of a palm tree and which has sort of a, um, uh, it has some of the properties of nicotine and it stains your teeth and stuff. You're a world-renowned choreographer and dancer who's working with a group of dancers on a new piece in a dance studio in mid-Manhattan. You cue the company to begin their run-through but 30 seconds into it, you stop them and tell them what ballet maestro George Balanchine told one New York City ballet dancer in 1980. It looks like you're coming from the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> you add what Bob Fosse said during the musical Sweet Charity's out-of-town tryout in Philadelphia. I can't see my number, people. <laughs> Gazing diagnostically at the group, you point to the lead dancer and deliver the verdict that ballet teacher Irene Fokin once gave one of her students. You dance like a carrot. <laughs> Hoping to inspire, you give the company the aforementioned notes, 
give permission to your armpits and unreliable spine, unreliable spine. You say what one of my contact improvisation teachers once told my class, throw your big juicy dinosaur ta tail over your shoulder. <laughs> But when the dancers launch into the routine again, you see that none of your advice has helped. So you stop them and suggest to them what Broadway choreographer Tommy Toon's personal trainer once suggested to Mr. Toon. Imagine that you are in white tights in a follow spot, dancing for thousands, and it is your own five minute solo, and you have diarrhea. <laughs> when several of the dancers give you a dose of side eye, you say what choreographer Rosie Perez told Jennifer Lopez on the set of In Living Color. Look, I'm sorry if I'm harsh, but I'm hard on you because I see your star quality and I'm just trying to bring it to its fullness. <laughs> when one dancer tries to make a helpful suggestion, you say what one staff member of a resort in the Poconos called Tamament told the staff members in the summer of 1938 when he was 19 years old. I'm Jerome Robbins and I'm the choreographer. <laughs> the dancers start up the routine, but you stop them again, increasingly frustrated, this time singling out one dancer and quoting Martha Graham to her. Oh, Sophie, you are so agricultural. <laughs> <laughs> to a second dancer, you say what one Native American dancer said to Agnes DeMille, the choreographer of the musical Oklahoma, when DeMille wants to part in a rain dance in Zuni, Colorado. You're white. Bad for the dance. <laughs> you cue the dancers again, letting them run the entire routine. When they're done, you repeat the comment that Agnes DeMille made to her uncle, film producer Cecil B. DeMille, about the dancing in his film Cleopatra. But that's a belly dance from a cafe, a dirty, angry prostitute spitting betel juice all over the stage. <laughs> you stomp your feet in frustration. You throw a chair. You scoff at Sophie whose work is looking more agricultural than ever. <laughs> you quote Martha Graham, why did I get myself into this? I should never have done it. The winter is lost. The whole winter's work is lost. You add something from ballet choreographer Anthony Tudor, the only thing that will help here is plastic surgery. <laughs> you go back to Martha Graham, I thrown away my Guggenheim fellowship. I am just frantic, absolutely a boiled owl. I am being nibbled to death by ducks. <laughs> you repeat what director Orson Welles told a belly dancer on the set of Around the World in 80 Days. The show is dying while I'm off stage. <laughs> you try some Isadora Duncan. What's the point of having me here with my genius when you make no use of me? You go back to Martha Graham. I'll never do it again. Cancel the season. <laughs> you storm out of the studio in a huff. Just as you reach the elevator, though, a thought occurs to you. You return to tell the dancers something that Martha Graham often told her students and company. Remember, one day, you will all die. <laughs> You return to the dancers and you single out Sophie, to whom you quote George Balanchine. Your work will lie elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs>